is where robots come when they, when they finish Robot Wars. So what are you doing here, Stu? Just looking for interesting shapes that we can use on the set. Uh, so we can tie them to uh, mesh panels. Let's get some nice sculptural shapes out of this uh, uh, salvage. That's good because it's lightweight. Huh? Heather, look at that. No, but they want something that they, can, that, that they can weigh properly, that they know what the weight is. I don't think we need too many items much bigger than that. No, it's kind of it's that's, the, that's the scale of it. I think we've seen enough. We ought to go and get the guy. If you haven't already checked in your radio control gear at the transmitter control over there, you must do that immediately. No one should use any radio control equipment until that has been done. About four weeks before the recording of the uh, series, we basically gathered all the robots together, which I suppose in traditional TV terms could be described as an audition. So the description is a cake-like object. Well, it's not actually going to look like that when it's finished because we're going to lower it down to mud guards on the, on the wheels and cover it for... From Dublin, Nemesis. Cakes. At, at the moment it looks like a big quality street tin. <laughs> From Mickfield near Stowmarket, Recyclops. The batteries come out of skip. <laughs> um, no, it's what no. robot was about. Yeah. Yeah, that battery is a dud one. We had to check out the robots, make sure that they conformed to all the health and safety rules. We also wanted to meet the, the actual teams and the people behind the robots to make sure they knew what they were letting themselves in for. So why is it called Recycle? Because everything's recycled. Recycle. Ah, you see? <laughs> How much did it cost to make? Um, well, we acquired a lot of stuff. So. Uh, I, I think we've, we've so far the most expensive part was the, the radio. That, that yeah. Hazard a guess at the cost? About, I'd say in total about 200 pounds. It was one of our rare opportunities to actually test out some of the games that we had been devising for the robots. We drew out a maze on the floor um, along the lines of the, you know, the plans that we were developing on the drawing board. In this week's trial, our five surviving robots have to take on a steel maze called the Labyrinth. This is meant to be a skill game. It's meant to be testing control and manoeuvrability and agility. So. Try and avoid going over any of the lines. Try and stay true to it being a maze. Imagine there are walls there. So only a complete idiot would ever end up going down a dead end. And the winner is whichever one gets to me first. The one that covers the least distance will be killed and eaten. The rules are there for people's safety and for the audience's safety as well. Uh, no untethered projectiles, no explosives, no corrosives, no acidic weapons, no liquid weapons, no form of interference in, in, in the form of electrical jamming or anything like that. We're going to have an exciting time kind of uh, looking at it from a television point of view. What's really interesting is how close we can get cameras. What I really want to do is get cameramen into the arena. But with the pickaxe and with the chainsaw, I might not be over popular to try and do that. The trouble is with these are the things that, yeah, okay, they're two or three feet long. The arena's big. We really want to get an, an exciting view of some of these, which, which could run at, you know, 30 miles an hour. That's the other reason most cameramen can't run at 30 miles an hour. And at the moment, there's some really good ones in there. With Cambridge University is one and a few of the others. There's some, it's, it's really looking good. There's some good stuff there. Uh, those guys arrived in all the um, camouflage gear. Yeah. That one, I thought, that's, that's a bit more like it. We brought our technical consultants along, people like Matt Irvin and Derek Foxwell, and the teams were given the opportunity to speak to our experts and uh, try and get their robots up to speed. Jack said that 8 o'clock this morning we'd report back. That was a mistake, wasn't it? No. Oh, right. It's now half past four. Now half past four, and we are very impressed. Very impressed. With all the robots we've seen. With all the robots we've seen? Yeah. And quite enthusiastic. Double, and doubly enthusiastic, yes. Yeah. <laughs> We built the house robots the best we could within the six weeks that we had to build them. But, um, but there was always that element of doubt in the back of your mind that somebody might come along with something that's absolutely amazing and sort of trash us to bits. <laughs> so, and on a programme where you've got fighting vehicles and fighting sort of elements within it, um, Flame would look excellent. And uh, eventually I managed to talk them into it. <laughs> and uh, say, yeah, we can do that. We can do that perfectly safe. It will be perfectly all right. Because there was a lot of worry about safety as far as Flamethrower was concerned. There were about 30 people involved in the setting of the scenery over about three days. 
Well, there's a bit of worry because obviously we're up against the clock. We've got a lot of uh, lot to do in a very short time. Quite a challenge, but I enjoyed it. It was good fun. Oh, that's excellent. Thank you very much. So you put a few holes in the reef, would you? Don't worry about it. Yeah. Tank trip. Yeah, lovely. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. I don't think anybody's done a robot set before. <laughs> it, it's, it's a completely new idea. And, and when we first got the brief, it was, uh, it was great. I mean, it just sort of boys to the job. It's great fun. <laughs> Three days to go now. Uh, just doing all the wiring. Should be getting this one to run in the next half hour, hour or so. Yeah, I've just tried it, it's all dripped on the floor a little bit. The first thing was to get the stage into place and, and then put erect the scenery around that. Trying to create some sculptures in, in scrap metal. Uh, we thought that was a very good way of working because it was A, cheap, <laughs> we didn't have a great deal of budget, and, and B, um, I knew I could get a good look, especially if I gave it a kick with some silver spray paint, that, that always helps. The look is the most important thing. We get something very sexy and metallic. Now that's why we use the neon signs and um, a lot of a lot of neon because it works very well on camera. It was incredibly tight. I mean, six weeks to, to completely from scratch to build these things because really the first week or so we were just waiting for materials to come. At the end of the day, it all pushed back. And, uh, and some decisions as to like what colour Sergeant Bash was going to be were left sort of to the, to the day of the studio to decide with it. So they've got, to, they've got to get on, then as soon as they get on it starts rotating. If they're very quick, they might just be able to dart out, but otherwise they're going to have to wait for a full rotation before it comes back around again. And then they're going to have to get off. And then, then bend them back. back, back yeah, yeah, no, I appreciate that. They don't, they don't, yeah. They don't. The doors presumably slide open for the first one and reveal the light and the smoke, and then that one rolls out. Yeah, and we'll cut to Jeremy or the audience or whoever. Uh, my concern is how much room you've got the back there for the robot to actually perch on that edge there, because it's not that, not that much distance there, is it? Yeah, it's four foot. Four foot, okay.